Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grillin' J.R. The, vo the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Conrad. Doing really good. Feeling blessed today. A lot of neat things to talk about. I'm sure it'll be fleshed out in the show, talking about Eric. Uh, I want to thank the folks for supporting my new website, uh, jimrossbbq.com, where they can order our products. And uh, we appreciate that little effort that we're starting. And so, in any event, things are good. Counting down to Christmas, you know, Conrad, I'm, I'm coming and trying to move in this new generation as best I can. It seems like I'm going to probably do most of my Christmas shopping online. Do you do that already? Yeah, absolutely. I don't see any reason to go to stores. Well, I mean, I want to support my local retailers, but if it's something that my, my, my local mom and pop shops don't sell, then yeah, I'll, uh, I'll find a way to order it at a dot com. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the way to go. And. And we got some good stuff uh, online that people can order our stuff, uh, pro wrestling tees, so forth, and all these good things. So we got, we got a lot of neat things. So I'm going to probably do my Christmas shopping, holiday shopping for on online, trying to, like I said, moving to the new millennium here, so to speak. So, but all's good, man. Uh, life is good. Uh, AEW still lets me hang around and, uh, I appreciate that opportunity every Wednesday night. So life is good, man. I'm a wrestling fan. Who's lucky enough at this stage of life to be in the wrestling business. And for that, I am very grateful. Jim Ross shirts.com makes a great stocking stuffer. And, uh, don't forget to come see us across the pond inside the ropes is where you'll need to see us. We're going to be making three stops in February. Stay tuned for more information about that. But we took to Twitter and let you guys pick what we're talking about today. We threw up a poll and to my surprise. It wasn't even close. People wanted to hear about Eric Bischoff and the WWE and he had some good competition or so I thought, uh, we put him in there against, uh, Umaga, who I thought would have been a very interesting topic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we also had December to dismember. Most people call that the worst WWE pay-per-view ever. And, uh, in your house, Degeneration X one month after the screw job, Owen Hart returns and starts a bit of a feud with Shawn Michaels. But alas, it wasn't to be, they wanted to hear about Eric Bischoff and we're going to have some fun with this. Um, I'm pretty excited about this one because this is a topic that is very topical right now because of his most recent run, but you weren't there for that. So we'll go back and, and talk about his run when he came in the first time after WCW goes down. But I guess before we do, we should sort of set the stage. Uh, Bischoff first gets a brush, a brush up with wrestling if, uh, with Vern Gagne in the AWA, mm -hmm. he, uh, he's yep. doing some cross promotion and, uh, meets Sonny Ono. They come up with Ninja star Wars and they decide the, the AWA show would be a perfect way to promote this. And of course, Vern sees something in Eric that he likes, maybe a potential salesperson for AWA. So he hires him to do just that. But then when Larry Nelson, the AWA announcer misses a show, maybe he had a run in with the law, a little booze in action. Vern asked Eric to fill in. Eric had a modeling background. So he thought, what the hell? I'll give it a shot. And before you know it, 
Eric Bischoff is on camera for the AWA. Is that where you first see Eric calling AWA yeah. stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Eric had the best eight by 10 publicity photo of, of any broadcaster ever in wrestling. Good looking guy, uh, very photogenic. Uh, his, uh, that accent he has, uh, played well on television, but yeah, the first time I saw him was actually doing, I want to say some interviews. That's right. We're interviewing some of the talents on AWA and so I did the same thing as everybody else. His voice di didn't annoy me. It was a good voice, but his look was very exceptional. So, uh, you know, he, he, he was easy to spot, uh, uh, in that regard. I don't know how well is how he, how he ever enjoyed doing play by play or whatever. Uh, the thing that a lot of us strive to do, but he was, uh, he's, he was very easy to stand out in a crowd. It's, uh, it's weird to see him in the old mean gene spot here for the AWA. And of course, at this point, the AWA is on its last legs. I mean, to the point that they're repossessing his cars out of his driveway and everything else. So, uh, he actually gets an audition with the WWF in 1990. And that video went viral a few years ago of him interviewing for the opportunity to work with the company. And very famously, they asked him to sell me this broom. Did you ever have such a conversation with Vince McMahon or see him do this with anybody else that you know of? Oh yeah. He did things like that all the time. He it wasn't just picking on Eric because at that time, I don't think Vince had any animosity toward Eric or any feelings toward Eric one way or the other, other than he was a fresh face off of Vernon's television. And let's be honest about it. Vince did real well taking people off Vernon's television and making money with them, including Hogan and Mean Gene and Bobby Heenan and so forth and so on on and on. So, uh, that wasn't unusual, but yeah, he would do, have guys do silly things, make them sit there, he could get them uncomfortable and so they could still function, be entertaining, informative, get, you know, do their business. But, uh, that was just one of his, the many things he, I can't, he did something to a, a kid named Charlie men. And I, I didn't work with Charlie men much. If I did, it was just a very short crossover a few days, seemingly. But Charlie thought he was really, really good back in that era. And he really, really wasn't. And, uh, so Charlie got his balls busted a lot, but when, I think on his audition, uh, they were a little bit uh, rugged on him for some reason. And a lot of times you just bring it on yourself, but, uh, Eric was, Eric, I, I didn't, I saw a part of that. I think I saw that interview that, uh, that, that cut, you know, and he was, he, he did all right. There was nothing wrong with his, his audition. Well, obviously Eric doesn't get the gig instead. He yeah. pops up for WCW about a year later. And by his own admission, he would say he was a C squad announcer. And I believe that your old pal, Jim Hurd specifically told him, Hey, I want you nipping at the heels of Tony Schiavone and Jim Ross. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, did you hear that from Jim Hurd from Eric Bischoff? When do you hear that one of the motivating factors in hiring Eric was to put pressure on you to do a good job? Yeah, uh, I heard it from Herd. You know, I hired this goddamn good-looking kid. Keep an eye on him now. You know, I kind of he's because I wanted to keep pressing and pressing forward. He's hungry. He's got a great look. The network's gonna love him. You understand what I'm saying? You know, I know what you're getting at. I'm still a fat fuck, Mr. Herd. I I didn't I could smile then. I had not had Bell's palsy, so I was I had a nice smile, nice toothy smile. Uh, and I can whistle and all those good things. So, uh, but you know, you know, I got it, you know, it's look, Conrad, I've been, ba I've been battling this particular issue, uh, in my entire career. So it wasn't the first time I encountered, uh, uh, this type of, of situation, but it was the first time I encountered it where it was so blatantly explained to me what was going on by the guy who did the hiring. So what, what do you, what do you think of Eric when you get a chance to meet him here in WCW? Obviously he's low man on the totem pole, but, uh, you've always been one to have a pretty strong opinion. what do you think? Uh, I, I didn't have a, I didn't have a, a, a discernible opinion one way or the other, because he stayed to himself pretty much. Uh, we didn't interact a great deal that much as you would, one would think perhaps, uh, I didn't have any major issues with him, you know, uh, he, 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 he kept, he played his cards tight and close to the vest. He's street smart. So he didn't want to piss off anybody in the early going or alienate anyone whatsoever. So 
he kind of withdrew a little bit. At least that's how I perceived it. So but now no issues with him. You know, he just, he, he did his thing and, and he was doing voiceovers down in the studio downstairs. I was in the, up on the 12th floor doing administrative work as well as the talent work. But most of my talent work, I was able to put it where most of my talent work was done live or live to tape. But, uh, we all had to do our share of voiceovers down downstairs in the, uh, in the, uh, little studio we had down there at the CNN center. So, you know, no, no major issues with him. Again, he, he was smart enough to stay off the radar and I'll give him credit for that. He, he sure as hell didn't allow his personality or anything to uh, intentionally or inadvertently affect how he was perceived. That's always also been a criticism of Eric over time that he could come off as, as smug or rude or short or curt or disrespectful, whatever sort of descriptor you want to use. And I think a lot of that is just because he is sort of standoffish. And and I think it is because he doesn't want to, to your point, he is street smart. Perhaps he just doesn't want to uh, annoy or offend or, or upset anyone. I mean, he even admits on our podcast together, I'm not funny. So I don't want to attempt to be funny, screw it up and offend someone. Uh, so he would rather just, you know, not even try. And I yeah. think that that is something that a lot of people misread. Would you agree with that? Yeah, of course. Uh, wholeheartedly he's, uh, and it's easy to, for, to perceive Eric, as you described. And I think probably at times in his career, I think it's inevitable that he was all those things that you mentioned that he was curt and that he was short and he was abrasive at times that he did proceed to be standoffish and smug and arrogant, whether he, but I, I just know him enough, uh, after all these years that there's a whole lot to what you said about it. He's a little introverted at times and that's not, doesn't fit somebody that's in a, gre- a gregariously oriented job as he has had in, in wrestling and on television. And then when he became a character, a big time character, uh, on, uh, during nitro, you know, I wasn't there. Uh, I was with the opposition getting our ass beat 83 weeks in a row. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just never knew him to, I never saw those other, ne- there's so many negative sides. When I got one of my, let, when I got let go at, here at, uh, at WWE one time, I'm trying to think what, what time it was, but it was early on, early in my list of, uh, of, uh, 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 exiting, I want to go back to work at WCW and, and I met with him and finally got a meeting and I, and I think that, uh, I, I, he, I had not had as much to drink as he did. So it showed me he didn't take the meeting very seriously and he did it out of courtesy as I'm looking, as I look back on it, but he never had any intention of bringing me back to WCW, uh, which is what I preferred to go back to Atlanta, live there where I had a place. Jan liked it. I liked, you know, the city, I liked everything about living there and, uh, still would live there if I needed to, I like it that much. So it just didn't work out. You know, he didn't, didn't, he didn't have any intention of hiring me back. And the reason he gave, uh, we talked about this later on is that he just thought I'd be disruptive, you know, a stronger presence he wanted to deal with. And he may be right, but nonetheless, it was the best decision. That, uh, that it was the best break I got was not going back there it's, during that time and going to WWE. It's a Garth Brooks song. It's unanswered prayers, baby. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. So let's talk about that. You, uh, when you leave, I suppose is what we should double down on because it's not too terribly long and you know, very quickly, this C squad announcer has given the opportunity to move up and be one of the executive directors. And supposedly, uh, or the executive producer rather for WCW, it's been said that Bill Shaw and Bob do expected Tony Schiavone, Craig Leathers, and Eric Bischoff to all submit proposals. Uh, apparently Bischoff made the best presentation. He had some big ideas and he got the big seat and flair was on record as being very supportive of this decision. Something he would probably question later. And, uh, Tony Schiavone didn't take it seriously at all by his own admission. He didn't have any interest in, in having that job and wanted nothing to do with it. So, whereas he sent in, you know, at best a one sheeter when they, when they pressured him, Eric had a fully thought out plan, right? This does not sit well with you though, or I'm led to believe 
that his deci- the direction he's going doesn't work for you because it's not too terribly long and you're out the door. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the thing about that is, um, Eric, my contract was ironclad there. I had a real good contract and a lot of it was verbiage that WCW put in there to really narrow down my job description. And I, for whatever reason, the more details of what you do and what your job description actually is, it's, it's a little bit more challenging to get out of the contract. And they thought I was an asset and wanted me to stick around. So I got a three-year contract, biggest contract I'd had to date. And, uh, so I was happy with that deal, but the, uh, the, when Eric got the job or before Eric got the job, I was never asked to interview. Uh, I was so tainted with the bill Watts brush that I was looked at as a, a leper, you know, a leper announcer. <laughs> uh, and so I, I didn't, I never got a, I never got even an opportunity to go talk, sit down. And I had a meeting with Bill Shaw finally. Uh, well, I had a meeting with Bill Shaw after, uh, it, it was, it was a decision to take me off the air and I had a meeting with him because, you know, I talked to my lawyer and my, and my representatives and I said, well, you know, your contracts are ironclad. They wrote most of it. So you're just adhering to what they're writing. And I told Shaw, they said, well, you're right. I said, you got about a two and a half years of vacation paid. Looks the way I look at it. That's how they managed. They had the, wow. more, had more, they had the money. So the deal was, Hey, look, if you don't like to do it, you don't want to do this, uh, uh, syndicated sales job and get, take off television for no reason other than we think you're too Southern, even though we've built our reputation on Andy Griffith, three runs and SEC football and the Atlanta Braves baseball team. Uh, we, we will, uh, you know, you'll just, you'll just set out. So I, I even tried that on for size. I went to Jamaica. I wasn't Jan. And I weren't, we're, we're, I don't think we've met. And uh, I went to Jamaica by myself and that was a big goddamn mistake. I never smoked so much weed in my entire life. I felt like I was doing a, trying to just a, a role for a Cheech and Chong movie or something. Uh, it was really, you know, it was, I, I, I soaked up the culture, the sun, the vitamin D, the booze got, you know, you, I did everything good. Like I got dehydrated, got sick, but I was having a great time being there on the Island, you know, come on. I was miserable because I wasn't in the wrestling business. So, uh, I, two weeks in Jamaica was about all I could handle. So that was that. And, uh, but, but I never got to ask to submit any kind of proposal. If I did Conrad, I swear to God, I can't remember it. And I think I remember, re- would remember that, but the watch thing, the watch experienced and anybody was on that, that cabinet, shall we say, and anybody that held a higher level cabinet position. Uh, on, on Watts' uh, you know, his, uh, thing there, it's like, what do you do? Uh, I, I couldn't wash it away cause it was, it was what it was, but it was a misrepresentation of who I was in my opinion, but, uh, that didn't matter. I could tell just by the, by the way you're talking on it, you feel like you were passed over there. Did you feel like you were as qualified or just as qualified as Tony Schiavone, Eric Bischoff or Craig Leathers to apply for this job? Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. I, we have to have confidence in our abilities. If you look like Eric, you get away with a lot more because he's got that great appearance that everybody wishes they had. I didn't ever have that. And so, uh, and I am not going to also say that at times I wasn't jealous of how good Eric looked and how, you know, I'm just a good old fat, good old fat boy from Oklahoma. So, uh, yeah, I, I, it was a tough, uh, thing to swallow because I thought I contributed to the business. I thought I had a, I had done a lot of work there that they were not aware of, uh, in booking wise, right. TV wise and all these areas. So it, it was, yeah, you want to run your, you want to, you want to catch on your own, your own team. You want to drive your own vehicle here, but that didn't happen for me on that, that occasion. But the best thing, as I said, was, you know, not getting that job. I think Eric probably at the end of the day. Because he was, he got so engaged to the product through being a character on television that probably it was a, it was a better fit, emotional fit for him and motivational fit for him than it would have been for me being the announcer. So I think, I don't know if I would have done as well as Eric did for that, that period of time there where they were actually making money. 
you know, but I don't know, but you, your confidence has got to tell you, Hey, look, you're going to battle this thing all your life, kid. You're a fat Southern boy with an accent. Then wait till later in life. The good Lord says, when I hit you with those three bouts of Bell's palsy, then we'll see what you are made of. So that's, that's just how it worked. And, but yeah, I was, I was pissed off and I was ready to leave that job. It's when I got hold of Bruce to come to work for WWE and talk to Vince. I wish we did and, and the rest is history as it were, but, uh, it, that was the best thing that happened to me was being able to get out of there. And Eric and I talked about that a lot, especially when he came in to, to, to work for us as a talent. All right, Jim, let's run a timeout right now and remind everybody that support for this show comes from manscaped. Who's the best in men's below the belt grooming. You see manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. So jingle balls to the walls, fella. Listen up. Untrimmed pubes are a thing of the past. It's time to gear up and get yourself the gift of shaving this holiday season. Of course, we're talking about the Manscaped Perfect Package 2.0. And, uh, man, everybody listening to this has had some sort of uh, situation where you've hurt yourself down there. And that's why this revolutionary company, Manscaped, has redesigned the electric trimmer. Of course, we're talking about the Lawnmower 2.0. It has proprietary skin safe technology. What does that mean? Well, it means this trimmer won't nick or snag your nuts. It's also waterproof, so you can use it in the shower. And the Lawnmower 2.0 comes inside their Perfect Package 2.0, which makes it the perfect gift this holiday season. It's literally everything you need to keep trimmed, cut free, and smelling nice down there. We should also mention that this Perfect Package also includes the Crop Preserver, which is an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. And speaking of sweaty, stinky balls, I'm thankful for their Crop Reviver. This product, along <laughs> with the Crop Preserver, keeps your balls from sweating, smelling, and sticking and by the way, these products smell good. Their manly scent is attractive and will help set the mood. If you know what I mean, you also get in this perfect package, a pair of manscaped boxer briefs that'll keep your junk feeling fresh all day. So it's time to upgrade on those old briefs you've been wearing. Tis the season to manscape. So get yourself, your dad, your brother, the friend in your life, the best gift of all the manscaped perfect package 2.0. And just because you listen to this show. We'll get you 20% off plus free shipping when you use our promo code JR at manscaped.com. Of course, your balls will thank you, but take advantage of this right now. Get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code JR at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com when you use code JR. Clean up your nuts and make Santa proud this year. And by the way, everybody's doing it, present company included, right, Jim? Absolutely. Folks, it just, it, you, you feel cleaner, you feel more refreshed. It's uh, grooming, grooming. And uh, so it's something that maybe we overlook sometimes or we think it's not, uh, you know, we, we can't, it's not cool. It's very cool. And I promise you, you'll get positive feedback. And if nothing else, you'll just feel fresher, you'll feel cleaner, and you'll feel more orderly. And this is important, folks, for our balls to feel orderly. It is my world. <laughs> Check it out right now. Manscaped.com. Use that promo code JR. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, the end of WCW. This, are you officially fired? Do you quit? I mean, well, I, I know where you are, where they're asking you to go do syndicated s uh, sales and, and, and you don't really want to do that. You want to be on air. Then mm -hmm. you decide you're going to take a stab at it. Ultimately you throw your hat in Vince McMahon's ring and you have him on the show and everybody sort of figures out, uh oh. JR is out of here officially though. What, do you think Bischoff thinks he fires you? He fired you or just demoted you or, and then you left in protest or how would you categorize the, the departure? <laughs> Good question. I don't, I would not say that Eric fired me. I wouldn't say that. I don't think that I don't feel that now. And maybe it was in a, you know, a cloak and dagger type uh, boardroom deal. But my, my issue was, is that if I, I, I wanted out. Or, or I was not going to work. So in other words, I, you can, I can, you can quit paying me and let me go, or I'll earn, I will get every check for the next two and a half years that I'm owed. And it was, you know, a, a good fat six year deal for me at that time in my life, it was a lot of money. So and I would, I would, I'd have got, I'd gone and done other things. I had a chance to work for the Falcons again and the radio in Atlanta was an easy gig for me to, to acquire. There are all kinds of things coming up. You know, hell, I might've become a podcaster. Who knows? 
but the bottom line is, is that I was not going to, uh, I was not going to not be used. Uh, and I was going to, I was either going to pay me all that you owe me and I should have held them up for some money. I should have said, I'll do this. I'll save you this much money if you pay me this settlement. But I wanted out so badly, I was ready to negotiate nothing. Let's just get this thing done clean. Release me and let me roll. And they did, and 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 Vince hired me. The the Vince the Vince thing was a done deal. I mean, he he we'd already shook it, shaken hands on that deal. It was just I had to get some some illegal shit done, and as always, as you know, you know how that goes. There's always a lawyer waiting to do something. Bruce has sort of joked about before that, you know, when this transition happens and you come up to the WWF, you apparently had some as random as this sounds appliances and storage on WCW property that, uh, <laughs> Bischoff was holding hostage. Yeah. That was about story. It just made a good story. What happened was is when I, when the Turner moved me from Dallas, uh, which another city I love living in still would, uh, love Texas, a lot of AEW action in Texas, you know, right now. So that's kind of neat. Uh, but I, I, uh, moved from Dallas to Atlanta and Turner moved me out there and I had a washer and a dryer and I think a refrigerator and the place that they, uh, I, they put me in the beginning was a hotel, which obviously didn't need the washer and dryer and refrigerator at the hotel. And, uh, so I, they, they stored it for me in, in their storage, uh, uh, facility. So apparently moving a lot of people, hiring, hiring, firing, moving, transferring, they have a big department that does all this stuff. So when I, uh, when I moved out of Atlanta, I'd never paid any rent on the deal. I never got a bill for it. It's just, we're going to, we'll hold your stuff for you. Okay, cool. Thank you. Well, when it come time for me to move, they couldn't find it. My washer, dryer, my refrigerator were missing. There is a W L. Uh, and so. I made, I made a story up in, in, in trying to uh, ascertain a certain level of humor that my appliances were being held hostage by Bischoff at WCW. And I'm getting word about my washer and dryer. <laughs> I'm getting worried about them. Yeah, the you best. know, I was, fr- I, I was fretting over it. Plus, you know, the refrigerator likes to be hooked up to the water so you get fresh water out of it. They, it does. He gets temperamental. So it was a real uh, kind of emotional thing. So I said, my shit's been held hostage. And some people took that as factual truth, but it wasn't exactly the truth. Well, hell, to be honest, it wasn't the truth at all. It, they were missing. They, they couldn't find where they stored it. And I did, we let it, we all agreed to let it go. One of the first big moves that Eric makes is to start taping WCW at Disney to cut costs and give the show what he would call a big look with the Disney flyover to start the show. And he's trying to position the show or the company WCW rather to not look second best. It was like, it was like, like a Disney partnership would lend WCW some much needed credibility at the time. And while he's down in Orlando with these tapings with Disney. Uh, Flair helps Bischoff set up a meeting with Hulk Hogan. And this is less than a year away from Hogan's last shot with the WWF. And they're right in the middle of Vince McMahon's steroid trial. What was your reaction when you hear about Bischoff having a meeting with, uh, Hulk Hogan? Inevitable. As much work as uh, was being done in Florida with Hogan living there, he, he didn't have to get on an airplane and, and, uh, and fly with a bad back. He's had a bad back that long. Uh, it was convenient for him to make a commitment on time. And it's a, it could be a difference maker. It makes you, it gives your brand instant credibility to hire someone, the stature of Hulk Hogan, no matter if he was in his prime after his prime before his prime, no matter what he was famous, he was over. And uh, I'm sure that when Rick and Hogan were talking, uh, they were talking about working with each other and why wouldn't they? So there's a lot of options for Hogan to do and including turn heel, which was magic with Hall and Nash. Well, before we so, get there, they do the, the ticker tape parade for Hogan and they I set, saw it. They set up the big, uh, the big dream match that most people thought should have happened at WrestleMania eight Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan. It happens at bash at the beach 94. It's a landmark show. 
and for WCW really puts them on the map. They do more business than ever before in hindsight. Do you think Vince missed the boat on not doing Hogan flair at WrestleMania? Yeah, absolutely. There's no reason not to do it. That's what I look back at. I, I look at the two, uh, individuals we're sp- speaking of here from a booker, former booker, a booker standpoint, creative person standpoint, whatever. Uh, and you got hit, you check all the boxes that are primary for a, a great attraction, big numbers at the box office, etc. And there's still enough gas in their tanks that if orchestrated correctly, they can still have a very solid, well executed wrestling match. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, there's no reason to not have done it. It's the match everybody wanted to see, but for some reason, sometimes Vince is, uh, seems to be adamant that he likes to do things his way. And sometimes I believe that he's been guilty. Uh, maybe we all have of not listening to the audience thoroughly enough because that was, that was the match. And so even though he didn't create it and book it, it's, that was the match and Vince is going to make the most money out of it. So I'd have booked the damn thing in a heartbeat. And that would, that would have been really easy. A really easy main event for WrestleMania eight was that. All right, Jim, let's talk about, uh, well, it's the Christmas season, you know, and, uh, if you don't want to have a blue Christmas, well, you need bluechew.com. Here's what we're talking about. If you like sex, you'll love bluechew.com. You see bluechew offers men a performance enhancement room room and at bluechew.com. You can get the world's first chewables that has the same active ingredients as both Viagra and Cialis and a bluechew.com affiliated physician will work with you to find the right dosage and active ingredient that's best for you. And because it's a chewable, it can work faster. And these chewables from bluechew can be taken on a full or an empty stomach. And the online physician console is free, so it's cheaper than those other two. Maybe best of all, it only takes a few minutes to connect with a BlueChew.com affiliated physician. And if you qualify, you get prescribed online quickly. What does that mean for you? No in-person doctor visit, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at a pharmacy. Instead, it ships directly and discreetly to your front door. The chewables from BlueChew.com are prescribed online by a doctor and, of course, made right here in the U.S. of A., and it's going to give you the confidence you need in bed every single time. You and your partner will love Blue Chew. So what are you waiting for? Go chew it and do it. And here's a great deal for you guys for listening to this show. You go to BlueChew.com and get your first order for free when you use our promo code JR. You just pay $5 shipping. That's B-L-U-E-C-H-E-W, BlueChew.com. The promo code's JR. And for just $5 shipping, you're on your way. And this is a game changer, is it not, Jim? Absolutely. And I got a friend that when she sees that my tongue is blue, she gets a smile on her face because she knows that everything is going to be all right sooner than later. So folks, here's the bottom line. Uh, there's no reason at our age or any, anything should, should restrict us from enjoying a positive, healthy sex life. And all I can say to you is from my own personal experience, blue chew works. And that's the best I can tell you. It works. And the fact that, as Conrad mentioned, that it's a chewable, it gets in your system so much faster. And so the, when, and that means that all of a sudden you're ready to go to work. And uh, so I'm, I'm a big proponent of it. Believe in it. Blue chew. If you see that my tongue is blue, you know I'm smiling. Yeah, check it out. Make this the best Christmas ever. And uh, put some smiles on some faces. Uh, a different definition of blue Christmas at bluechew.com. And use that promo code JR. I'm telling you, you'll be glad you did. Well, we're moving out around quite a bit here, but eventually it's announced that Bischoff is going to make a bold move and he's going to put WCW programming head to head on Monday night up against Monday night raw with nitro. When you first hear the news that, Hey, we've got real competition and it's WCW on Monday night and they're going to be live every week. Whereas we're taping shows in advance at this point. What's your, what's your take on that? Do you think this is real competition or. Is WCW still uh, perpetually going to be the little big brother of, of the WWF? I thought the WWF had a massive head start as they do right now. Uh, no company is going to threaten WWE's market share anytime soon. Uh, likely in mine or your lifetime, Conrad, quite frankly. But that's not a, a sad, sad tale to tell because there's plenty of money out there, plenty of uh, revenues to, to earn. 
in the entertainment world that uh, a company like AEW, for example, can, 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 can enjoy and make significant profits over time. So uh, I, I, I just uh, I think that uh, uh, what, what, what we're talking about, train of thought, I just left. Uh, I was thinking about no, something no, else down the road. It's Nitro being announced. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, here's my, my issue is this. I, I question whether they have the in-house personnel to pull it off in a big way. And of course, a lot of that stuff was, uh, uh, you know, David Crockett probably doesn't get enough credit for some of that stuff because he was one of the, you know, one of the big producers there and, and, and on-site people, but getting the staff together to do the, the, you know, the, the, the rigging and the lighting and the, everything. Uh, I didn't know if they were, they, they were ready to do that because everything had always been on such a smaller scale. And then to be able to do it live every Monday is a major, that's a whole different world. So I, I didn't know that that was going to be as, as successful as it was. And it, it was a pleasant surprise actually, because it made the business look better overall because they had, they had great production values and the shows look clean and slick. You might not agree with the creative, but hell that's normal. You can say that of any era at any show, but they, they, the show looked good. And I thought that was a step in the right direction for them. So you could, you can tolerate a good looking show that might not be the greatest creative for a little longer, not forever, but a little longer than you can the other way around. Eric made a big splash. The very first nitro when he announces that Lex Luger has jumped from the WWF to WCW. Um, what's your take on that? When you hear that, Hey, we thought we had him, but we don't, he's gone. Yeah. That, uh, was a disappointment. You know, I, I don't know, Conrad. And I I know it sounds, this sounds shitty for me to say, but I just didn't see what we were losing. The, what the, here's what we lost. We lost shock. We lost shock value. We lost the, the war or the shock value on that night. The surprise factor. That's what we lost because Lex was, Hey, look, we tried to get him over. He tried to get himself over here as well. Everybody worked the Lex express, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It didn't work. He never got over to where the level he should have, or to the level that we, the money was invested in him to make that happen. So I'm thinking, okay, they beat us in the surprise area, but what, what did they get out of the situation? Are people going to see the same Lex Luger match they've been seeing for 10 years or so? Probably. So the, I, that's how I looked at that thing. But I knew that the games, the antes were being raised and that, uh, Eric was going to be a very aggressive poker player. Yeah. And that's never more evident than when he becomes lead announcer on nitro, much like Vince is on raw, but maybe one of his more controversial decisions, especially at the time is he's giving away the results of a taped raw show live on nitro. So the viewer doesn't have to feel like they're missing anything. <laughs> if you're an old school guy, you you've got to think this is sort of playing dirty, right? Yeah, a little sure. You, you, but you understand you, you get into a fight, you fight to win. Uh, I just think it's really ridiculous. And of course, this is, I guess, a uh, foreshadowing the, uh, NXT and AEW Wednesday night stuff. But you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we all know why it wasn't by accident that, uh, NXT ended up on the USA network at exactly the same time as, uh, AEW, it was to retard our growth if big, big or challenge is good. It can always be justified in any verbiage you want. Anyway, there's a lot of ways to skin that cat and a lot of ways, your honor, that you can make a case for either side. The bottom line of it is, is that it's created more interest, uh, on that night than, than it has been in wrestling and, and, and maybe forever on Wednesday nights. Uh, and it's, uh, it's giving a lot of talent, the opportunity to be seen by more people than they heretofore have been seen. That's a good thing. And I think it's overall good for the business, but I, I'm, it's sad that it's gotta be head to head because, you know, we, I don't know how much better it would be for both brands if it wasn't head to head, but it is. So you go out and roll your sleeves up, you get to work and you fight and do what you gotta do to make your brand better. So, uh. But that's kind of how I see that, that matter, you know, on the, on the television side, Connie. Somewhere around this time, Vince starts to position himself as being in a war with Ted Turner himself. And I've always found that somewhat interesting because Turner was always somewhat hands-off when it came to WCW. 
and, and Vince presenting himself as the underdog feels like, you know, he's trying to be the baby face and he's trying to get sympathy here. Why isn't he not, why is he not positioning himself against Eric Bischoff? Because that dynamic doesn't exist. I mean, Bischoff is, you know, financially a regular guy at this point, by and large, and Ted Turner is a billionaire. So it's just an easier story for Vince to sell to the public and the boys, maybe much, much easier, much easier to, to have his vendetta wink, wink, quote unquote against billionaire Ted than unknown Eric. And also Eric was becoming very prominent on the TV show and the promos are, you know, caustic at times and a little coarse, uh, you know, he- heated, effective. And, uh, Vince, I don't think you want to give him the time of day or you know, re- acknowledge that he existed. Uh, but Ted was okay because Ted was in a comfort zone. Ted didn't, Ted wasn't aware of what was being said, nor did he probably, do you think he cared? No. So he, I, I think that. It was a kind of a strategic thing for Vince to do in that regard. He never acknowledged Eric as a star. And as soon as you start mentioning his name, his, 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 uh, name identity and his perception increases. So man, the old school, just let it go. He didn't say nothing about it. Well, the, uh, the fire continues. The whole mess happens with the, the razor diesel lawsuit. Eric Bischoff is even personally named in the lawsuit. Uh, he becomes president of WCW 97. And by that point, WCW is regularly thumping the WWF in the ratings. And around this time, Bischoff is giving locker room speeches to sort of rally the troops. And one of the things he's pretty routinely talking about, even out in the open is that his goal is to put Vince McMahon and the WWF out of business. When did you first hear that? And I mean, I know a lot of people say, oh, how dare he? But Vince put a lot of guys out of business. And I'm sure when, when he first had aspirations of doing that, a lot of the old time promoters thought they were going to put him out of business and that some sure, of his wrists yeah, weren't yeah. going to work, and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. When do you remember hearing, Hey, we're back at it again. And somebody says they're trying to put Vince out. Well, I think somebody, you know, from the meeting called Meltzer and Meltzer had, it, uh, had it, uh, followed it, reported stories. I recall. Reading it in the observer or, or somebody calls age, you hear what Bischoff said to, to the talent. Cause all kinds of leaks going back and forth both ways, uh, this incessant leaking. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I here's I, my emotion, my reaction, Conrad, I rolled my eyes. Sure. I rolled my eyes and I'm, I went about my business because I, no matter what I was doing, I had better, more realistic things to do. Then worry about Eric and his team putting Vince out of business. I just didn't see that happening. Let's keep it moving here because there is an interesting time in 1998. I don't think you and I've talked about it before. Uh, the Mr. McMahon character is in a white hot feud with stone cold, Steve Austin for the first time in April of 98, that match main events raw. And we end the 83 week streak raw actually wins the ratings night. So a month later, as we're going back and forth with WCW and the WWF flip-flopping every week, Eric is no longer comfortable in his position and does something a little unique. He actually challenges Vince McMahon to a fight at the WCW pay-per-view Slamboree. Uh, What's your reaction when you hear that? This is where we are, guys. We're challenging each other to fights on pay-per-view. That probably was another eye roll. Like, come on, it ain't going to happen. It's publicity. He's a, he's a, he's a performer. You know, he's, he's like the, he's like a carnival barker, just like the rest of us are. And he was, he had a story to tell. He's looking for attention. He's looking for, looking for a recognition for acknowledgement, something to tangible to hold on to. So it was kind of like hot shotting the territory type thing. Oh, this is kind of a hot shotting of a promo and saying, and making a challenge that you knew good and well, and never in a million years was ever, ever going to happen. Hypothetically, if it did happen in 1998, who do you think would have won? Oh God. Well, Vince is bigger and stronger. So Bischoff had to get him early because of Vince, Vince is a lot, a lot of strength there. Eric, by, by Eric's training, he should win his MMA training. You know, he was, he was highly skilled in the, in the martial arts. At one point in his life, kick kickboxing, I think, right? Yeah. So I, I would think Eric would have the advantage uh, in that regard, plus youth and all that good stuff. 
the Vince would be stronger. The only thing about the old man is I think he see, you know, he told me one time he never lost a street fight and he grew up around a bunch of Marines there in North Carolina. So I know he could, he's, he ain't afraid to tussle. So, but I don't know. Eric should have been the favorite in that deal. Uh, if I had to, if I had to gamble, I'll gamble on that, but it could also be a, you know, a, a real, uh, quick, quick finish uh, in McMahon's favor, but I kind of think Bischoff probably slip over so they could work the return. <laughs> I love you for that. Well, let's fast forward. September of 99, Bischoff is sent home by Harvey Schiller. Uh, when you hear the news that uh, not only is Ding Dong the Witch is dead and uh, the streak that WCW had is now in the rear view, but now Bischoff, the guy, the only guy to put Vince McMahon on his ass for 83 weeks in a row, he's, uh, he's sitting at home. Does anybody in the office think, hey, maybe we should try to have a conversation with that guy? I don't think so, Conrad. No, no look, uh, I, I was pretty much uh, a member of Vince's inner circle during that crucial time. Uh, and, and I wasn't by myself. I'm not trying to say that, but I, I never heard that conversation ever take place. I, I don't think Vince still was convinced that Bischoff was that smart and didn't give him the credit for the success that he had, even though, as you mentioned, uh, 83 weeks in a row, we got spanked. So, it, hey, that's just the facts. He, they they have better creative. They they got they didn't lose their momentum, but when they lost their momentum, they never were able to really truly regain it. No, no. At least it didn't seem like to me that way. I just and and if you had all this great thinking power there and all these wonderful assets and talents, you know, you got to reshuffle your deck, obviously. But you would think that they could rebound uh, and get back in a, a, a more favorable position quicker than they did, but it just didn't work out for them for whatever reasons. All right. Now, listen, we've talked a lot about, uh, man, tossing and turning with the different angles and ups and downs and politics and the never ending <laughs> grind of professional wrestling. But what we can all agree on is it's all worth it. If you get a good night's sleep, but if you're not getting a good night's sleep, if you're tossing and turning, if you're waking up with, you know, pain in your neck or your back or you're stressed out. You're not going to be at your best and you just start to have a miserable existence. I think everybody knows better sleep, better you. And if you get a good night's sleep, you're going to have a good attitude. You're going to be more productive. And that's what purple is all about. Of course, purple is the world's most scientific mattress. Check this out. A couple of rocket scientists have been out here developing cushioning technology for 30 years for stuff like medical beds and wheelchairs. And then a few years ago, they created purple. And purple is probably unlike anything you've ever felt before. Literally, they made it up. No, it's not memory foam. This stuff actually sleeps cool, and it gives me a zero gravity-like feel, so you can sleep in any position, whether you sleep on your side, your back, your stomach. You're going to love purple because it's both firm and soft at the same time. But as a fat dude, I love that it's breathable. It keeps me cool at night. But don't take my word for it. Why don't you just check this thing out? Here's how you know it's a great product. A hundred night risk-free trial is what they're offering. And if you're not fully satisfied, you can return your mattress for a full refund, a full refund. And oh, by the way, it's backed by a 10 year warranty. They offer free shipping and returns, but you're never going to return this and they make it easy for you. They'll even come set it up in your house and take out your old mattress. You're going to love purple. We sure do. And right now our listeners will get a free purple pillow with the purchase of a mattress. That's in addition to the great free gifts they're offering site-wide. All you've got to do is text JR to 84888. That's JR to 84888. Now the only way to get the free pillow is to text JR to 84888. That's JR to 84888. Message and data rates may apply. But you and I have checked purple out and this is legit. Is it not a hundred nights risk-free? How do you lose with this, Jim? You, you can't, you can't lose with it, folks. You can only gain, you can gain better sleep. It's good for your body. It's good for your mind. Uh, get up refreshed, ready to attack. And that's what we're all looking for. No matter our age, uh, like Conrad said, this, this thing, uh, sleeps cool and man, there's nothing in the world. I hate worse than waking up sweaty in the middle of the night. I, I just can't do it. I like the coolness of my sleep. So there's many reasons I love Purple Mattress, but the as Conrad mentioned, the bottom line of this bottom line, Stone Cold might say, is the fact that after 100 nights, 
uh, I've had relationships that last 100 nights. After 100 nights, uh, you can return it. There's no harm. There's no foul. You can't lose. The only thing I said earlier, you can gain is a great night's sleep. Think of it this way. Purple mattress is your sleeping salvation. Enjoy it for 100 nights free. All you got to do to get this free pillow as well is to text JR to 84888. Check it out. You'll be glad you did. Of course, we know Bischoff's going to come back in the company in April 2000, try to work with Vince Russo. He's going to go home in July after Bash at the Beach. And then he's going to start trying to put together a deal to buy WCW. We know none of that ever happened. So March 26, 2001 happens. It's the last Nitro. WCW is kaput. Uh, but once the invasion angle gets kicked off in the summer of 2001, it seems like it would have made a lot of sense to Eric, for Eric Bischoff to come in. But he sort of insinuated that you called to sort of feel him out, but maybe you didn't give the full idea for whatever reason. And maybe I didn't know the full idea. Well, Eric gets the impression that you didn't really want him to come in based on mm-hmm. the tone and tenor of the call. Your response? No, well, it's not accurate. Uh, anything to help the company, uh, I was for. And if Vince believed, and it was Vince's idea to bring Eric in there in that role, uh, totally Vince's idea. So as far as I know, and here's what we can all, we can say this accurately. Vince loved it or it would never have been done. Uh, so, uh, but no, I, I, when I was asked to find out his interest, it was that find out if he has an interest in working with us. And when Eric asked a very viable question, what am I going to do? What would I be doing? I didn't have an answer for him because I didn't know the answer. And then like many of our peers in the goddamn wrestling business, Conrad, I just want to make up some shit. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I don't know. So that's what I told him. I don't, I don't know what the role would be, but obviously it's going to be more of a, a controversial heel. I would think a heel role. I had no idea he'd be the, he'd become the general manager of raw. Uh, I think that's what it was. Yeah. So he, there was a good gig in that regard. And he, look, there was a lot of pushback on him coming into the locker room. He had issues in the beginning, you know, I think him and flair had a, a dust up and some other Mickey mouse, uh, sophomore, uh, class bullshit, but, but overall, you know, he, he did the same thing he did when he first came to WCW, he tried to stay low key and out of sight and out of mind and just mind his own business and do his, do his job and, and call it a day. Jim, and, why, why would you tell the truth and just admit you didn't want him to come in? Cause he still had your fucking washer and dryer. Yeah, no. Well, it, the deal was the fucking refrigerator put it over the top. <laughs> Here's the best part. Bruce says it was a mini fridge, but it was your favorite mini fridge. <laughs> Shit, I don't know, man. I, I, it, I don't remember. Bruce remembers more minutia and more irrelevant, irreverent bullshit than anybody I know. God bless him. Uh, I, I wish I had his re- recall. Uh, and I don't know how he has a recall, but he does. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I didn't have any issues against Eric in that regard. Look, I had gone on. I don't know, man. I, maybe, maybe we listen to a society where we're supposed to hate and, and p- stay pissed off longer. I don't know. I just don't carry that shit around. And I, I had noticed hey, if he can come in and help us and get better ratings, draw more money, make more money. God damn. Come on, brother. We need all the help we can get. So that's kind of the deal. Anyway, freshen up our product. He had great name identity. He could cut a promo. It's a, it was a smart hire for the talents. We're appalled because of how he had killed WCW. So all of a sudden now he's responsible for killing WCW as if they give a shit because they're working for us anyway, you know, go figure that out. Let's, uh, let's take a sidebar and, and, and ask when you have like an exploratory call like this and you say, Hey, would you have any interest in doing anything with us? I mean, money doesn't even come up, right? No. Okay. So it was, it was, it was simply to say, Hey, it's a lot easier to do it this way to find out there's an interest in returning to the business. Cause some guys are going to say, you know, I, I need to, I need to take a break from the business. Uh, I need to step away for a while. So I, I don't have any interest at this time, but if I could leave the, if we could leave the door open, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying never whatsoever. 
And, but you know, that's, you want to know that. So you can either table it, get rid of it. I'll call you back in two weeks. So we're not going to call you back. Or, oh, you want to, you want to call you back in a year. What's, what are we doing here? So you find out what they're, what they're, what they, what they're looking for to make them comfortable to make a good decision and hope the decision in our favor of hiring the guy. So that's all I've found out. Eric, he seemed like he was interested in coming back to work. I, I wasn't able to answer all his questions. And I, and I said, and I, and I told Vince, and I think they created his, once they found out that he had an interest, as I recall this Conrad, then they went to more work in, in refining a role because there's no reason to refine a role for Eric. If Eric didn't want to come to work. Right. So, but I, I never had any, uh, I never had any, any grudges in that regard on that situation. I just, that's not the way I live my life. It's just too complicated, man. It's like the goddamn being around the people that lie all the time. Can you imagine how much effort they put into fucking lying when it's just a whole lot easier to, re- to tell the truth? Cause you can remember the truth. So nonetheless, uh, I'm glad he, I'm glad he came to work for us. We should mention that, um, I, I believe Eric's testimony is that you called him the Thursday before the invasion angle started. So maybe you didn't know at that point, but clearly Vince had an idea to involve him in that. And in early 2002, we see the NWO in the WWE, which also feels like it would have made sense for Bischoff to be the person saying he's going to inject poison into the WWE to kill it rather than having Vince say that. But again, it's not Eric. Do you remember Eric's name being brought up for that storyline? No, uh, nothing, nothing specific, quite honestly. Um, you know, I, I think Vince had always had a, something in the back of his mind to utilize Eric, but he had a special role in mind. And I don't know that he just finally discovered that we could make him the general manager of raw and all this. And they had the big hug on TV and quite the moment, you know, so it was, a. Re, re uh, aligning the, the guards, you know, the villains were now standing at the doorstep and it was kind of interesting. I thought that McMahon and Eric were, you know, two of the big, badass guys on our shows. I liked it quite frankly, but, uh, you know, I don't remember uh, that's the, there was always something for Eric there. It's not, you ain't gotta be goddamn, you know, Bill Watts or Eddie Gray to figure out there's going to be a role for Bischoff. He had too much national TV exposure in a very positive light for his character and his character had roots and a background and a following. And again, there's that all important name identity. And then bam, he, he put him on our show with some role that makes sense. And they found the role that made sense. So, uh, I, I, I always thought he did a good job for us. And he was involved in a lot of angles, man, a lot of storylines. He was involved in some, I was involved with him, man. So. That don't make him good by any stretch, but nonetheless, uh, he'd be, he, I think he busted a cinder block over my head. So maybe he got over that, uh, me making a late call to him for the angle, the cinder block <laughs> thing. What the fuck, man? That's so <laughs> silly. Unbelievable that that's actually even a thing. Uh, I know the, the next call comes in May of 2002. Kevin Nash reaches out to Eric and says, Vince is going to call him and Vince calls the next day. And obviously the angle winds up being. The new GM of raw is going to be Eric Bischoff. Right. Um, it is, it, it is interesting to me that he's brought in as an on-screen character. And when I talk to him, he says, you know, nobody ever asked anything about behind the scenes in that era. Like he was not asked to contribute or his opinion at all. Correct. Yeah, you're right. What? Well, why? I mean, if you know, you've got a guy who, who helped, you know, put Vince on his ass, why well, not at here, any point say, Hey, what do you think about this? I think that the, here's the thing, uh, and this is how I perceive it and I could be wrong with me. I perceive that the door's always open for ideas and suggestions. I never heard anybody be turned down or turned away from, from, for giving their opportunity for their, to provide their, an opportunity to provide uh, some feedback. Especially, uh, and I'm thinking Eric had plenty of feedback on his promos. He's not the kind of guy that would go memorize them word for word and go out and deliver them. So I think he did probably have more creative input than, than maybe, uh, he purported in that particular statement. Uh, but official role, no, he didn't have one, but hell, that's a lot of guys didn't have an official role. They just contributed to their own stuff and he's too damn smart not to be able to, not to do that and take advantage of that opportunity. So. 
I don't, that's just a difference in semantics. I think a lot of it, Conrad there, you know, he, he, he just, that was just not his role at that time. If he, Hey, maybe if he had stayed longer and, and, and Vince had got more comfortable around him and so forth, maybe that would have evolved. I, I, I can see it evolve. It did. And eventually like long way home as the Eagles would say. So, but it was a, it was a strange that that was, he was, he, he had, a, Eric had a lot of, uh, uh, challenges, perception challenges when he came to work for the WWE and, and a lot of them were not. And quite frankly, it's because he was a good competitor and whipped our ass and people don't want to associate with the guy that whipped their ass very often. To the point that Stephanie calls and tells Eric, I want you to know you have a lot of heat with the boys. I'm not sure you know what you're getting yourself into. Uh, <sighs> at some point when he meets with Vince, Vince says, you know, I'd like to think if the roles were reversed, you would have extended me the same opportunity or something like that. And he thought that was the most gracious and, and polite thing that Vince could have ever said to sort of calm or settle whatever nerves that Eric may have had. Cause he didn't have to say that because it would have been easy to just sort of spike the ball on him. And if the roles were reversed, Eric admits that maybe even he would have done that, but when, when Vince goes the other way and is very gracious with him, uh, he feels pretty good about it. So his TV debut, July 15th, 2000, uh, 2002, uh, Vince called in May to pitch the idea. So it's much different than a year prior when it was just a few days notice. Um, this is a silly question, but who knew and who didn't know? I ask because I think this was always thought to be a surprise and, uh, uh, in this era, there's a lot of times where creative would be hidden, even from the boys and we're quote unquote, working the boys. And you're just gonna, it's going to be a surprise, pal. Just react naturally. Is that what this is? Yeah. I, I knew Eric was coming in, but I didn't know all the details. Again, that just followed my MO and Lawler's. Right. You know, we, we didn't need to know we we're going to react, you know, and make you happy with our reaction, hopefully. But uh, I don't think it was a, uh, uh, broadcast thing, you know, here's, I love this term. You know, well, you know, they, they, they're, they kayfabe the boys, you know, why the boys got to be kayfabe because they talk, right. And now they can talk even more. They can talk on, on the record, off the record, fake accounts and whatever. And now they can, so you don't tell them anything because unfortunately they're childlike at times and they can't keep their goddamn mouth shut. What'd you think of the creative? You know, where Vince introduces him and, and then Vince and Eric have a really big hug and really milk it for the crowd. Gets a big reaction. Did you like it? Yeah, I loved it. It's like Satan and his little brother finally found out they were they were adopted by different parents and they had this rejoiceful hug in hell. It was just amazing, you know. Uh two great villains, man, that had worked very diligently to, to overcome being uh not perceived as star talents when they got in the business with supporting roles, Vince, you know, doing these little shows in the Northeast, doing some, some announcing Eric doing some, uh, backup work for Larry Nelson. Then all of a sudden, boom, here they are. And it's pretty, it's a pretty good little journey there. You start to think about it. Uh, so I, I, I like the pairing. I thought it was, the hug was bunny. The hug was a classic moment in time in WWE history, in my view. Jim, I heard the old cliche a long time ago. There's no stress like money stress. And the older I get, the more I realize, man, that's not a cliche. That's real stuff. And if your finances have you stress in this holiday season, let me give you a pro tip. Save with Conrad.com can cure what ails you. You see your house payment is your single biggest bill. And at save with Conrad.com. Not only are we going to get you a cheaper monthly payment, but in addition to that, you're going to get to skip your next two payments. So you pocket all that cash for not one, but two months. And man, that's going to give you the cash you need right now during the holidays. Really think about that. If you haven't already made your December payment, you won't make that or January. You're done until February 1st and come February. Well, you're going to have a better mortgage. And I'm talking to you. If you're in a 30 year loan, you may not realize it, but the term on your loan is killing you. Most people don't really think about when they pay their house off. So they wind up just giving away tens of thousands of dollars of their own money. We're routinely helping listeners to this podcast save 60, 70, even 80,000 bucks. Why would you work for all that money, pay taxes on it, and then just give it away? Keep more of your own money and find out how easy it is to save your family tens of thousands of dollars right now at savewithconrad.com. 
Now you don't need perfect credit. In fact, even credit scores in the 500s will qualify. And there's absolutely no money out of pocket. If I can't save you money, I won't waste your time. Find out how much money you can save right now for free in more than 40 states we're licensed now at savewithconrad.com. That's savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. Well, of course, right after this, Stephanie is announced as being the new GM of SmackDown. It feels like we're trying to recreate the magic of the Monday night war. We've got a Bischoff running one show and a McMahon running another. Is that the general idea? I don't know. That, that sounds too well thought out to me to describe. It might've been, might've been, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what I've always thought that Stephanie was largely misbooked, uh, over the time, but she's a great performer and she's plays a, and she plays a wonderful villain. So, uh, but it, it was interesting. You know, good. It was a good, it was a new dynamic. And I, and as far as being a new dynamic and give me something fresh to wrap my head around is generally a good thing. Let's talk about the success of the Bischoff show. Uh, his debut does a 4.28 rating, which is uh, pretty strong. And Meltzer would even follow up uh, a few weeks later saying all the shows since Bischoff came back have been good and well received. And, um, there is an interesting tidbit in Meltzer's report where he says a bit of a warning. There may be forces behind the scenes working to screw over Eric Bischoff already. Some feel the only reason Vince brought him in was to humiliate him in the end. You know, whenever I've, I've presented an idea like that to Bruce, that, you know, Vince, you know, was just doing this to humiliate somebody and he wanted to embarrass them. Bruce always argues, where's the money in that? That's stupid. You wouldn't make an investment like that to, to squander your investment. Who does that? That's stupid. I bet you have a different take. No, to bring Eric in just to humiliate him. No, absolutely. If this brought people in to humiliate him, and I wasn't there, uh, I was there for a lot of talent acquisitions, uh, uh, and arrivals and departures, a lot of them. And. He never brought somebody in that I ever had any dialogue where he's going to say, let's break this, hire this guy. Let's get good news and medicals and do all the shit we got to do all of our due diligence, spend money to get him, get him here. And then let's plan for his failure. It just is illogical and it takes time to think of that kind of shit. Well, here's the thing. I'm not suggesting that he wanted anyone to fail, but I am suggesting this is a guy who, uh, pulled your head out of your own ass. I mean, <laughs> we, I, it's hard for me to buy into the fact that he didn't have a little bit of joy in humiliating folks. Well, he seemed to have at times, no doubt about that. I just got the turn, uh, our, our book in and there's some significant information about that. I think my observations, my opinion of some of those things and, and what, you know, I think maybe he's. It, it, it's justifies some of the, not justifies, but explains some of the things he's done. He had, I think he had five stepfathers. He had a rough, rough ass upbringing, man. And I'm not taking up for him because I was blunt with a lot of his bullshit, but I, I, I just think there's, there's reasons behind the way he conducts himself at times that I am not aware of. I'm not Dr. Phil or Dr. Jr. even. So I don't know, man, I, I, but you're, you, there's something there but he has a perverse sense of humor. I can tell you that he laughs at stuff that the most people wouldn't laugh at. Let's talk about the other guys in the locker room. You know, he fired Steve Austin by FedEx, uh, allegedly through coffee and Eddie Guerrero. He denies that, uh, he had creative issues with Chris Jericho where he left on not the best terms. And then of course there's Rick flair where at one point Rick decided he couldn't shake it off. And he couldn't get his confidence back. And once he started to really feel like he was himself again, he sees Bischoff walk through the dressing room and his heart sank. And he just felt like he couldn't do this anymore. And he eventually in 2003 had enough and attacks Eric and Eric would say through working punches and, uh, Arn Anderson is there to try to help break it up and. Uh, Sergeant Slaughter's there to try to break it up. And 
you know, eventually Vince sits him down and says, Hey, you can't attack him on property like this. I need you to put this behind you. And Rick even wrote in his book, fuck that. I'll never forgive him. There's a lot of animosity with guys. Do you, did you have any conversation with any of these guys, whether it's Eddie or Jericho or Rick or anybody about their issues with Bischoff? Everybody that came to me to uh, discuss it. I didn't open up old wounds, uh, to, under the auspices of being proactive. Uh, I didn't go re drill the, to the nerve, you know, but guys knew how open I was in communicating with them. Uh, and so I didn't have any hard time, uh, getting it out of them so they could express themselves so I could reassure them that we're not going to have any negativity in this regard. We're not going to have any violence. You know, we're not going to be, do things that are stupid that cost you money or suspension or whatever, cause you get no leg to stand on. You just can't do it. So I said, you gotta get over this shit. You know, I, we, I talked to guys I talked through it and we, most of them admitted that I was right, but they were reluctant to still accept the terms and conditions of being a professional. So, you know, it was just, a, it blew over quick though. I thought it blew over quick. And after a few weeks, it was as if Eric had, you know, been around for a long time. Let's, um, let's talk about the fight. When, when did you know that there was an issue with him and Rick that night, the night of the fight, which I think was March 17th, 2003 at TV it was a TV, uh, one of the stooges, whoever there's a plenty of them couldn't wait to tell me, give me the dirt and you know, you go check it out and you, nobody's hurt. There's nobody bleeding. I don't think of any significance. Uh, you know, the stories grew by the moment. This guy was there and Jack Lanz was there and Harden Anderson holding people back. And somebody tried to help Eric and Harden, you know, you got, became like a, a goddamn scene from Deadwood. So it's like, what, wait, what a production this is. So, but it was just a, it was a, you know, wrong place. Both guys, wrong place, wrong time. Rick, all that animosity, uh, you know, lashed out and. It wasn't the right thing to do. Obviously you can't conduct business this way. So, you know, I, but I think it kind of got everybody's system. It, it seemed like after that, I don't recall any other incidents, uh, after that, uh, that one night. So if they had that much animosity and they got it out in that little skirmish, then, uh, I'd say we did pretty good with that deal. September of 03, uh, Eric starts teasing and promising something next week on the show called HLA. And it turns out the next week we find out this is hot lesbian action. And that term is used 63 times on the show. A couple of women come out and these, are, I guess, are indie workers from UPW. And he starts talking to them about sex and violence. And, you know, they do all kinds of stuff. And then eventually Rosie and Jamal come in, leave the ladies laying. Man, this is uh, not a weak. good look. Yeah. It's weak. It's not, it's not, it's, hey, look, you can't blame Bischoff for that. No, no, he no. didn't, he didn't write it. Nobody's blaming him. I see that, but, uh, you know, he didn't, he, he's just, he's, he's, he's carried out the marching orders. Here's your script. Here's what you say. Here's what you do. Overproduced bullshit. They had no place on television, they had no sustainable value. Ladies and gentlemen, whatsoeffing ever hot lesbian action. <laughs> and, 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 and I, and I'm just begging you to tweet me that. Well, Jr. I liked it. You know, well, you're going to identify yourself as a predator or some crazy person. Hot lesbian action, my ass. Can you believe that shit? And we know there's going to be something along these lines, and we got to mix. We got to be able to tell some story out of it. And you wish you could just lay out the whole goddamn segment and not be associated with it. Lousy ass. That's where these. That's where the uh, the sports entertainment term that WWE has invented that the entertainment was overshadowing or engulfing bad creative was engulfing any wrestling that we had to provide any physicality, any drama, any sporting feel. It was all about the entertainment side. So, you know, Vince was like a cross between Walt Disney and Larry Flint. He didn't know who the hell he was. One of the things I, uh, I glossed over. Uh, Eric Bischoff is, uh, chosen to bring back the big gold belt and he does this on raw. He just creates a new world title. It's the old WCW belt and he just hands it 
to uh, Triple H. What you? You're an old school guy. What do you think about creating a new belt and just handing it over? Weak. It is, you know, making a new belt and having a having a presentation to when a new champion is crowned in some sort of systematic uh, order, like a little tournament or something along those lines. But something that's better than just gifting it. That's like giving a kid a, a uh, uh, almost participation medals or trophies. I don't believe in that either. I think that's wrong. You should be awarded for what you earn. Uh, and there's nothing earned there. And I don't think it did that title any favors for, for a long time after that. It never seemed like it had the credibility uh, and, and look where it went now. It's, it's somewhere in a, probably one of your, on your, one of your walls down there in Huntsville. No, it's not. I don't, I don't think they even know where that, that first one is though. I think, uh, Ben Brown's still looking for it. Uh, another famous story from, uh, September of 02, I think it is, is the wedding of Billy and Chuck. I'm sure we'll cover this in long form some other time, but let's, let's don't. Uh, well, the it's, gist. it's hideous. Goddamn hideous. I mean, come on. Well, it's all this social awareness and being more politically correct. So what we're going to do is we're going to take hot topics that aren't com- really uh, totally acceptable yet. So let's just don't even go there at all. Yay, nay, or indifferent. Uh, and, and, and portray th- this, that gay marriage is fine. We know it's fine. But this is a mockery of it, to my view. I thought it was a, a complete mockery of same-sex marriage. It wasn't funny. It was supposed to be humor. Well, it wasn't funny. God damn it. If it's supposed to be funny, then you should laugh. Who's laughing at it other than an uncomfortable laugh that you hope your buddies aren't aware that you're watching this shit? That's what I think. I, it was horrible. My God. That's my point, I guess. You, you see... We're just going to have him hand a guy a belt. I don't yeah. make any sense. We're going to, we're going to make him bring out hot lesbian action and then beat up some women. And then we're going to do, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're going to put him right in the middle of a SmackDown show where he's the raw guy and he's going to be dressed as the, the preacher who's uh, doing the ceremony for Billy and Chuck's wedding. It's just, I don't know. It does feel like Vince is having a little fun. Uh, could be, yeah, it could be in that role in that casting it could be, uh, but you know, I got to tell you, uh, Eric did a hell of a job as that preacher The the makeup people did a great job of concealing his identity. Uh, I thought he did. I thought he did a good job there, but Hey, look, he's, he's cast in a role that his scene on that week's soap opera was this. And I, I think there's a lot of moving parts in that piece of business. And if Vince had the idea somewhere in that thought process, well, this would be a good way to, you know, really stick it to Bischoff here a little bit, just for the fun of it. He might have thought that somewhere during the thought process, but that being the primary reason to do it, so they could, you know, they could pull a Ned Beatty on deliverance on on uh, on Eric. I don't think happened. It's pretty remarkable that, you know. We're still not done. We're also going to humiliate him with this storyline with, uh, Steve Austin, you know, uh, we're going to have lots of shenanigans with Steve Austin, including, you know, beer drinking contests and vomiting. And then we're going to introduce Eugene as his nephew. It, <laughs> it starts to feel like we're just piling on a little bit. Um, I can't, Hey, look, you make a very valid point, Conrad. You really do. But to tell you that I said in the meetings, and I think Bruce will tell you the same thing. And we both were in a lot of meetings uh, there with Vince. I never heard him once position things this way. Like, okay, I guess I got a great idea. We're really going to hate this one. <laughs> so, you know, I, I just don't, I didn't hear, I never heard it, but it certainly is incriminating evidence that something was afloat back in the day. During a Halloween episode, um, Vince McMahon would book Eric Bischoff to make out with his daughter, Stephanie McMahon. And another time he booked, (laughs) he booked Eric Bischoff to make out with his wife, Linda. What the fuck is going on in the mind of Vince McMahon here? Oh, you're asking me. Well, (laughs) it's just, I mean, again. I'm not, I, I'm not Dr. Phil, as you said, I'm not even Dr. Conrad, as you said, but my goodness, we're, 
We're getting our former biggest competitor to make out with our daughter and our wife on TV. Good television, pal. Good television. We're talking about, are we? (laughs) 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 Oh my God. The big laugh. Yeah. So, you know, that's, I, I don't, I don't, you're asking me very valid questions regarding Vince that I have not the slightest clue of how to answer logically and honestly why he does some of the things he does is part of his genius in a crazy perverse way. There's no doubt about it. He is a different breed of cat and him. I remember the scene. I was very uncomfortable with the scene where Eric and Linda had their kissing thing. I think they take that at Vince's house. Uh, and the Stephanie, when I can't remember the setup for that one, he was in but, a Vince McMahon mask. He was, he pretended to be her dad. And then it was revealed that it wasn't her dad making out with her. It was actually Eric Bischoff. And that's it. All that's creepy. Yeah. So I, 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 don't, I can't tell you why, what comes out of that mind, but it's, it's, a, it's some different stuff, folks. Let me tell you, it's just some different stuff. Well, you know, and again, I'm not trying to psychoanalyze Vince. It's just fascinating to me that we're doing this with one of Vince's, you know, former uh, biggest rival. And there's no, no more of a surreal moment than the promo on the way to one night stand Oh five, where you've got Paul Heyman, Vince McMahon, and Eric Bischoff all in the ring together. And if you'd like to see this, you can just throw it in your Google machine. Paul Heyman invites Eric Bischoff to ECW one night stand. And obviously we're, we're years past when this was. When this would have been really, really special, probably, you know, six or seven years too late, but Vince Heyman and Bischoff all in the ring at the same time, quite the visual, huh? Yeah, absolutely. One of those old Yogi Berra things, the who to thunk it. Uh, it was a, it was a, a, quite a night. I liked all those, uh, those ECW WWE shows. I thought they had great passion and emotion, uh, and kind of what they're trying to replicate with the NXT now and. SmackDown and Raw and doing it the course at the, uh, perhaps singling out a little AEW action. We'll see, but who cares? I tell our guys all the time, why do you give a shit what they're doing in NXT? Who cares? I, I look, admire their work, learn from it, but damn sure don't get, don't let it intimidate you because we got to do our shit. We can't do, we can't do anything. We can't, I learned Conrad and I, I was really late in life when I learned this. I used to get really fixated over shit that I could have no, I had no control over. I would get so focused on problems that I had no way of solving and then be frustrated to the point of being sick when I couldn't solve the problem. It was unsolvable for me in that particular situation. So I, 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 I just, I can't, I can't go there. I can't, I can't see that deal, but, uh, those three guys are icons and, and a certain, in an era there of wrestling or they were as big as it got as the players behind the scenes in this game. Let's, uh, start to wind this down and, and talk a little bit about the end of his run here and him sort of behind the scenes. Uh, Bruce tells a tremendous story about an interaction at Jerry Briscoe's birthday party. And you know, where, where Eric was just one of the boys, the longer he was around, as you said, it did sort of, he did start to sort of blend in and everybody just accepted that he was part of the crew. Yep. Do you have any fun or interesting stories or memories of Bischoff? Just the guy not on camera. Well, you know, I, I found him to be a very, uh, interesting guy to talk with. He could talk a lot. He talked, he could, could and liked to talk about things other than pro wrestling. Uh, I liked his vision and liked his creativity on as far as his business entrepreneurship is something in that creative area. Uh, he was interesting to talk with about a lot of things. And then we had a lot in common, you know, both brought into the business with neither looking to be a wrestler, trying to make it as a broadcaster or a salesperson or whatever. We both did a lot of the same gigs for he, for Vern and me for the cowboy. So there's some common ground there. Uh, but you know, again, Eric was hard to get to know back then but I got the chance to talk with him more. And we, I always ask, I, you know, I always, I try to talk to him at every TV, you know, uh, what's going on, anything you need, everything. All right. You know, and you know, to let him know that if you need anything, I'll, I'm, I'm here. 
So nothing specific stories other than as time went on, I think that time in WWE with Eric, when he was a character, even though it looks like Vince was having some fun with that stuff. And maybe he was, I'm not trying to defend Vince in that deal. I don't know. It's just that we never talked about it. Uh, I think that, uh, uh we, Eric and I became better friends and a lot of that animosity, uh, all, all that, as far as I'm concerned, all the animosity I had towards him for, uh, you know, for, you know, poor me in it on my side, I didn't get him. He helped me. He retarded my break or I, I should have had that gig, not him. Wah, wah, wah. It's subsided. And I don't give a shit about it anymore. I'm happy. And I'm glad that he had, a, he had a good run. I've had a great run. So, uh, you know, but th that time in WWE really helped us establish a relationship, not based on the instance of that moment, the animosity, the, uh, hurt feelings and all those things. We both moved on and to this very day, I, I think we have a very civil relationship. Well, he leaves WWE in a uh, fun fashion to say the least. He, uh, he gets the script, thinks it's funny. They wanted to get his character off the air to give it a rest. Stephanie assures him that's not going to be the end of working with him. They just, you know, wanted to take a break from the GM angle here. He'd been doing it for like three and a half years as an evil dictator. And he, uh, he's cool with it. So he, he takes a look at the script and says, maybe instead of having John Cena throw him into the back of a garbage truck, that it should be Vince who throws him into the trash and, uh, they have a bit of a kangaroo court here. Vince decides his fate on TV announces he's fired. He gets, uh, dumped into the, uh, the garbage truck and he's out of there. And that's the end of Eric Bischoff in, in WWE. And then we know years later, he would pop up in TNA. Were you surprised to see in 2009 that he's getting back in the wrestling business, but it's not with you guys. Instead, it's in fact with Dixie Carter. A little bit, but not wholeheartedly because it's like the rest of us, Conrad, it's in his blood, you know, uh, and it's hard to divest yourself of something that you've been so passionate about since you were a kid. And Eric was a fan as a kid. And, and again, had that, that, uh, unique job, uh, uh, journey to get where he was. So uh, I wasn't surprised that he, he, he was getting back in the game and really at that time. Uh, Dixie and her, her crew there at, uh, TNA were the best option. There was no WCW, right? So what's next? And, and you, and you already been at WWE for a few years. So to me, that was the obvious, obvious destination. But it's all, you're always surprised because the surprise to me is I wonder what their job description is. I wonder who has the, what say and what autonomy, or if you don't have any autonomy, what's, what is the structure? And that's what I never did get straight with a lot of the hires there at, at TNA is that who, who was the bull of the woods and who wasn't. And uh, some, sometimes as we both know too many cooks in the kitchen is not a great thing. Well, he, uh, had a little run here recently with WWE that has been pretty well documented and he's got some other stuff cooking behind the scenes, but it's worth mentioning that Eric Bischoff had way more success producing television shows than he even did in wrestling. And that's hard for us wrestling fans to believe because the height of WCW and nitro and the NWO are so big, but I think a lot of fans just sort of lose sight of the fact that he's really more of a TV guy than a wrestling guy. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, when he got that, when he and Bruce both got announced to be, uh, in their new roles on raw and SmackDown respectively. Uh, you know, I, I was certainly, I like both guys that they've got, you know, their families are still with them and, and, and all this stuff. And I, I just, you know, you hope that they do well, but I never did understand the job description. I always do this. Whoever is running the show on SmackDown or I, and the reason I say SmackDown because it's on Fox. It's going to, is a, a more hypersensitive role in my view than the set person on, on raw that's answering to the USA people. Now I'm not saying that one's better than the other. I'm just saying that there's, there's a lot more learned people and a lot more pressure on, on network television and all the perks WWE is getting off with all the promotion on Fox, which is astronomical, uh, boy, Sunday football is you're, they're all over it. 
I have a direct TV, uh, you know, direct ticket guy or whatever you call it. Uh, and you know, I watch a lot of football on Sundays when I can, and there's a lot of promotionless Fox games for, for, uh, SmackDown. It's a great deal. It's a great deal for them. So, you know, I, 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 I think that, uh, the SmackDown role is, a, is a, got a bullseye on it and you got this, you got this structure, a corporate structure where there's a fall guy. If something doesn't go quite right, or there's a miscue, uh, or, you know, there's a fumble, you got a fall guy that, that can be replaced. That doesn't try to tear up the machinery. He stuff him out or her out and sent somebody else in. And I think Eric was a victim of that to some degree, because I never did understand how the system had changed that had been in place forever where Vince is always the last word. Everything's got to go through him. And if that's still the case then nothing's changed, you just create a role that is expendable that if you replace it, it can sound good. It makes sense corporately, but quite frankly, it's almost expected and it won't be the last time those positions change. I can promise you. When it's all said and done, what do you think, uh, Bischoff's legacy in wrestling will be smart guy. Great. Uh, really, uh, had, had great ideas, a little ahead of his time on certain things, but a good TV guy, a really good TV guy with a good eye for a, a solid product, misread, misunderstood by a lot of people, but, uh, overall a winner in the wrestling business. No doubt about it. And he's a winner right here on Westwood one every Monday with 83 weeks. If you haven't already go check out 83 weeks, get Eric's perspective on all things, AWA, WCW, WWE, and even a little bit of TNA. And, uh, he's pulling no punches over there. And it is a much more business associated conversation and maybe a little less about creative, more about business, but a fun look into the mind of Eric Bischoff, the businessman and the creator and the salesperson. And, uh, Jim, I appreciate you taking the time for us to catch up and talk about Eric Bischoff a little bit, been a lightning rod of controversy seemingly from the minute he got in the business. And I guess when it's all said and done, he's, uh, he's like a lot of guys in the business, just a businessman. Uh, you've said it before. Everybody here is trying to make a living and it all comes down to the two C's cash and creative. And it certainly feels like that's what it was for Eric as well. And if you're looking to spend a little cash this holiday season, you can pick up that cash and creative shirt at Jim Ross It is the absolute best way to support the show. Pick up a shirt, Jim Ross And you and I, man, we're, uh, we're going across the pond. We're going yes, to, sir, man. to England. To see our pal Kenny McIntosh. I'm pretty excited about this. It's you know, going- Kenny McIntosh is the Vince McMahon of Great Britain. You didn't know that probably, but it's out there. That could be a shirt. Uh, Kenny is a very bright young man, uh, and got a great crew that works with him. We're going to be in London, Manchester, and Glasgow. Yep. So, uh, February 7th, 8th, and 9th. Your tickets are on sale now at inside the ropes.co.uk forward slash JR. And I can't believe it, but uh, you can get a VIP experience for just 77 bucks, which is priority seating. And you get uh, pictures and autographs and a real meet and greet. And yeah, man. it's going to be yeah. a good time. Yeah, get go VIP if you can afford it, folks, really. And Conrad just outlined there's very affordable tickets. Uh, VIP gives you the entire experience and, uh, you won't regret it. I can promise you. We always make everybody feel special. That's there because you are, and we're just the honor to be able to play the London and Manchester and, and Glasgow and, uh, you know, Conrad and I are big eaters. You can tell by looking at us. So we enjoy the different cuisine. I always enjoy the train ride because, uh, it rocks me my big ass to sleep. I love that. And they got Wi-Fi, folks. They got Wi-Fi. Even for us OGs, we'd like to have our Wi-Fi. So it's all good. I can't wait to get over there. It's a wham bam, wham bam tour, Conrad. Three days, three one-night stands in three different areas. But only guys like you and me can handle that kind of thing. We got this. We got this, Conrad. And I got your back, buddy. Well, listen. I appreciate everybody having our back this week. We've got lots of fun stuff planned coming your way. Uh, don't you dare miss any of it. Hit the subscribe button. Leave us a five-star review. If you think we've heard it, tell a friend to check out grilling Jr. every Thursday only on Westwood one. 
Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.